Dr. Lawrence Lustig. I'm the, uh, uh, I'm, um, the Howard Smith Professor and Chair of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery at Columbia University. About one in a thousand kids is born with uh, genetic deafness um, or, or, or can born, born with a profound hearing loss. And, you know, we think a significant portion, about half of these are genetic in nature. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the genetic, the landscape for genetic deafness is challenging. It, there's, so, the, right now there's over a hundred different genes that when mutated, we know will cause deafness. The reality is there's probably a lot more out there um, that, you know, in combination with, with other mutations can also lead to deafness. So it's a really complex field and, um, uh, you know, virtually every single cell within the inner ear when mutated uh, and stops functioning can somehow lead to some form of hearing loss. So it's pretty complicated in, in general. Now, um, interestingly, most forms of, of, of deafness are due to loss of particular forms of cells called, they're called hair cells, auditory hair cells. Maybe be helpful if we backed up a little bit and just talked about how we hear. So, you know, the way we hear sound comes down the ear canal. Those sound vibrations bounce off the eardrum and travel through the middle ear bones. And then they get to the inner ear, the cochlea. And the cochlea then um, transforms those sound vibrations into an electric signal that the brain can understand. So that, that transformation uh, occurs in this complex organ called the organ of cordy. And the critical cells in the organ of cordy are called hair cells. And when those hair cells die, that leads to hearing loss. So most, almost all forms of sensory neural deafness uh, are due to loss or, or, or non-functioning of auditory hair cells. So this particular form of deafness that we talked about uh, today in the presentation is due to a mutation in a particular gene called otopharylin. Otopharylin is a gene that's involved in the transmission of the hearing signal from the hair cell to the brain. So um, without that gene, the inner hair cell can't talk to the auditory nerve. It's the, what, what happens is the, the neurotransmitter, which is supposed to be released from the hair cell, can't get to the, the nerve that's innervating the hair cell. And it's like flipping a light switch. The patients can no longer hear. Now, this, this leads to, interestingly, a very um, rare form of deafness called auditory neuropathy. Um, we actually, just to back up a little bit, we've got two types of hair cells. There's the inner hair cells, which carry sounds to the brain, but then we have the brain feeding back that signal back to the ear through the efferent pathway in the outer hair cells. And the outer hair cells actually, um, they modulate the incoming sound. So, but really all of the sound coming into the brain is coming in through the inner hair cells. So when you, when you stop the, the otopharylin gene from functioning, you basically no longer have transmission of the sound from the inner hair cell to the brain, but the outer hair cell system is still working. So there's two ways we screen hearing in babies. We screen them with what we call ABRs, acoustic brainstem responses, and we also screen with what's called otoacoustic emissions. Now, ABRs measures the, the inner hair cell function and the pathway to the brain. Otoacoustic emissions measure the outer hair cell function and the pathway away from the brain. So with this particular form of deafness called auditory neuropathy, the inner hair cell pathway is shut off, and so there's no ABR, but the outer hair cell pathway is still active and working. Um, so you do still have otoacoustic emissions. Um, the, the reason why this is relevant is because of a lot of hospitals when they're doing newborn hearing screening, they start with otoacoustic emissions because it's easier to do. They don't do ABRs. They don't do ABRs until they say they fail the, the otoacoustic emissions test. But for this particular form of deafness, if you only scream with otoacoustic emissions, you're gonna miss out on these kids until later because the outer hair cells are moving fine, even though they can't hear. So it's not until you document that the kids can't hear that that's when, they, that's when you start doing ABRs and identify these kids. And, and what, we, what we now realize is that the earlier you can intervene, the better. So the earlier you can identify kids with hearing loss um, with, with ABRs, the sooner you can get genetic testing and determine whether you'd be a candidate for this type of therapy or, or in the future, another form of genetic therapy. There's a lot we know about the ear. Um, there's a lot we can tell patients about why they may or may not have hearing loss. But at the end of the day, we have three treatment options for hearing loss. Option one is to do nothing. For a lot of patients, that's not an option. 
Um, but if you don't really want treatment, no one's going to force it on you. If you're if you're a parent and want to raise your child in the deaf community, that's certainly an option. But most most kids with 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 with, with profound hearing loss, um, their parents would like to be able to communicate them with them verbally. So that leads us to either hearing aids, which are for patients with with moderate mild to severe forms of hearing loss, and then cochlear implants for severe to profound forms of hearing loss. And for otopharyngeal kids who are born deaf. They are the perfect cochlear implant candidate. So that's really the gold standard of therapy for them. We put in a cochlear implant, and they actually end up being very good performers because the nerves themselves are robust and everything seems to be working otherwise fine, except for the fact that the inner hair cell doesn't work. We use is we have we have a virus, um, this so-called adeno-associated virus or AAV. Um, we load up the gene into the virus. Um, viruses are really good means of injecting DNA material into cells. That's how they do their job. But these viruses are engineered such that they have none of the pathologic proteins that causes a cell to become sick and die. Basically, the virus unloads the payload and it's done. Um, and in this case, it unloads the payload of the genes we want to make. And then the, it basically takes over the host's cellular machinery and then the, the, the cell that's been infected with this virus now starts making the protein you want to make. So we sort of re-engineer these viruses to do that. Um, it's a little bit more complicated with otopharyngeal because the size of the gene is too big for the virus. And so we had to, we had to come up with sort of a, a tricky way of doing this using two different vectors, two different viruses, with the gene split in half into each one of those viruses. And when both of those viruses co-transfect a hair cell, um, the, the, the genetic material recombines into the full length protein, uh, the, the full length message RNA, which then makes the normal protein. And so that's how we're able to do it. So the core trial, it's, um, you know, we, we, we're on three continents, we're on two continents. We're in Europe and in Asia. Um, uh, in the U S we're allowed uh, to treat kids from age two to 18, um, in both the UK and Spain. Uh, you can go down much earlier. They didn't put the lower age restriction on. Uh, initially, the initial patient population in the U.S. was only patients over seven years of age until the safety could be established. But this is a phase one, phase two uh, FDA-approved trial. Um, uh, we're, we're looking at both the safety of the delivery of the drug as well as the, the efficacy, how well it works. So to date, we, we have one kid that's been dosed in Boston here in the U.S. just recently. We have no data on that kid yet. But we have two children who've been dosed in, in, in Europe, one in the, both in the UK. Uh, one child was dosed at age uh, about 10 months, and one child was dosed about almost four years of age. But the results, if I can be completely frank, were, were jaw-dropping to all of us in the field. Um, so the, the child that was born early on and was identified very early because had an older sibling who also had otopharyngeal, um, she had surgery at age 10 months. Um, we had really no adverse events related to the, the gene delivery itself. There was a few sort of kind of common things that you might see after a surgery, but nothing related to the gene delivery technique. Um, the child, when we started following the hearing over time, we measure hearing two ways. We, we look at the ABR recovery. As I told you, the ABR is absent um, in, in kids with otopharyngeal deficiency. So we looked at ABR, but we also did auditory threshold testing, basically the same kind of auditory testing that you would have in a hearing, in a hearing booth. Uh, where you play a tone and we, we, we see whether or not you can you hear that tone. Now, in babies, you, you, the babies can't respond. So what you do is called uh, behavioral audiometry. You, you teach them to respond to a sound and you see at what threshold they respond to that sound. So it's the equivalent of an adult audiogram. So what we saw is uh, uh, you know, we have six-month data in the 10-month uh, old child um, who's now you know, um, over a year old. And um, number one, she's got recovery of ABR thresholds to, so I would say, moderate levels. Um, but when we look at the auditory thresholds, she's responding at thresholds in the normal range, and particularly in the speech in the speech frequencies. So there's a little bit of conductive hearing loss, likely due to the presence of a little bit of middle ear fluid. Um, but otherwise, the, the hearing responses, the inner ear responses are essentially in the normal range in the, in the, in the key speech frequencies with a little bit of high tone hearing loss uh, that we saw as well. Um, uh, and, you know, we actually showed some videos of the child responding to sound, not just at six weeks, you know, the mom clapping behind the kid and having her turn her head and look at her mom without the implant on, by the way, because these kids also get an implant in the other ear, which is the gold standard. Um, uh, 
Uh, but then at six months, you know, um, the, the mom is, the child is sitting on the mom's lap without the implant on. She said, turn around, give me a kiss. And kid turns around, gives her a kiss. It's, it's pretty remarkable to see. It's, it's, it's just, it kind of brings a tear to your eye. Um, now, all of these kids initially, oh, the 10-month, the sorry, the 4-year-old the um, was dosed. We only have six-week data for that kid. Um, and what we see is that at six weeks, the hearing, the, the ABR and hearing thresholds are commensurate with what we saw in the first child. So this child also seems to be um, slowly regaining hearing over time on the same timeline as the other child. So there's every reason to hope and, and believe that uh, we're gonna get uh, a, a similar uh, types of hearing results over time. Well, so, you know, these are this is a rare form of deafness. Um, you know, in the US, we see maybe 20 to 50 patients per year total. Um, and so, you know, just, just trying to, number one, um, getting the word out that there is now a treatment for at least one form of genetic deafness. Um, really encouraging all cochlear implant centers where these kids usually end up to do genetic testing on every child born with hearing loss. Um, you know, trying to get kids in early uh, as soon as we can because we think earlier intervention is going to lead to better outcomes. Um, and just trying to get as many kids that we can in the trial to see what this looks like in a larger group of, uh, uh, of patients. And we're going to need to follow these kids over years. Right now, we can determine that the that the, the threshold that they're detecting sound is is in the normal range. Um, we don't know what they're hearing. We don't know what it sounds like to them. And it's not until they're older and we can start doing more complex testing like like word understanding, speech understanding testing, um, hearing and noisy backgrounds. That's really when we're going to know how well this works and compares to something like a cochlear implant, which which is the current gold standard. Thank you.